All right, so I've been taking YouTube a little bit more seriously this year, and I thought I would share my lessons learned of mistakes that I've made and things that I've jotted down over the last six months that may help you guys out if you're starting a YouTube channel in 2024. Number one is enjoy the journey. It's not about making as much money as possible, but if you feel so inclined to hack the algorithm and make videos in a fashion that is to enable monetization in your channel as quickly as possible, then go right ahead. There's plenty of strategies out there that you can follow. I'm gonna dive into some production details of video, lighting, and audio. Tips and tricks that can help you out if you're just getting started so you don't make the same mistakes that I did. Start with video. Check and recheck your settings. If you're shooting in manual mode, check your white balance, check your exposure, check your volumes in your camera before you get started shooting. I've made it a habit to do a test clip where I set everything up, I start recording, I make some audio checks, I do some video checks, throw it in the computer, convert it from S-Log3 to Rec. 709 so I have a good idea of what it's going to look like when I color correct it, and make sure all my settings are how I want them to be. This has saved me multiple times with different things in the background that I don't like, that I might find distracting, and can help to give you a consistent look throughout your videos, one video to the next, so you're using similar settings or the same settings if you're filming in the same area over and over again. White balance is probably the biggest one here. If you have the ability to use a custom white balance, right now I have a 5600 Kelvin light and my white balance is set to 5600 Kelvin. But auto white balance has gotten really good on cameras lately. The caveat being that if you turn the camera off or turn the camera back on or switch locations, the white balance will change shot to shot. Now the ZVE-1 that I'm shooting on here has something called auto white balance lock. So you turn the camera on, you get your auto white balance set to something that you like. You can click a button, lock it in place. But again, if you're switching between 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second, 24, you're turning the camera on, you're turning the camera off, that auto white balance lock will go away. So that's just a disclaimer. You'll still have some variation, or I guess more variation shot to shot than if you were using a white balance card or you know, you know the Kelvin of the light you're using and you set that to match in camera. Oftentimes, if you don't know, it's better to just pick a consistent white balance throughout your shots. That way, when you get it into post, it will be a little bit easier to correct. Your shots overall throughout the film will look similar, and it might save you some headache chasing those orange or blue hues to get them the way you like them. Second one in video is don't be afraid to reshoot. I know it can be daunting to turn the camera on, to start talking, to kind of get in the groove, you finish your video and you're, whew, man, glad that was done. But then when you get into the edit, you find either mistakes that you made, a more clear way to express what you were trying to talk about. So don't be afraid to turn the camera back on and reshoot those shots. I know it kind of sucks. And it took me a while to get over this too, but mistakes that I've made have kind of forced me to turn the, cam turn the camera back on, get back into it, re-record and then as I'm doing it I think of a better way to say what I'm trying to say and overall that leads to a better video for both you and your viewers. The third point in video is shoot two to three more times b-roll than you think you need. There's nothing worse than when you get your a-roll done and you've got it assembled on a timeline and you reach for your b-roll and two or three shots later you're out of content I know I've found myself in this situation where as the video goes on, the less I film B-roll, the less I have to overlay on top. So I'm really trying to work more on show, don't tell, and I still need to work more on that. I'm pretty good at telling, <laughs> uh, or at least I think I am. And I, I want to get better at showing things over top or even just general, no, with no A-roll or no voiceover, just straight video to get my point across, which is a little bit different and weird to think about, but that's something that I'm working on. So B-roll is good. You can never really have enough um, B-roll in my opinion. And almost every video that I go work on, I wish I had shot more B-roll to overlay on top of the A-roll or create little cinematic cutscenes or montages 
throughout the video to keep people entertained. Next, let's talk lighting. Lighting has been my biggest trial and error in this whole process, and it's very much personal preference. How do you want to light the shot? Do you want to have shadow fall off on one side of your face? Do you want to have evenly lit faces? Do you want to have practicals in the background? What does your background even look like? Make sure it's not too distracting for people in the audience, so on and so forth. It took me a while to get color temperature right. Generally, I've had shots come out way too warm or way too cool. Um, it took me a little bit to figure out the 5600 Kelvin, how to color correct it the right way, what exposure to shoot this at in camera to get a better result in post. So it takes a little bit of trial and error, especially if you're using just panel LED lights. Like I have the Elgato behind me. Uh, I have a key light mini on the other desk. Those things tend to produce more harsh shadows than, say, a light with a softbox on it. So you just have to be aware with aware of that, and you might need some additional diffusion, or you might need to bounce that light in order to get the right softness if you're looking for that type of lighting. Taking notes on lighting was one of the ways that I helped kind of dial in this setup. The countless, I'll call it hours, hours of setup and behind the scenes, just sitting here in this office, putting the light in a different spot, having different lights in different places to try to fill in shadows and get the background in a place that I wanted it to be uh, that nobody saw, right? So you just have to kind of do those things. You got to sit down and it's it's a little bit grueling because if you're shooting in S-Log3, you set the camera up, you have to take the test shot. You get the SD card over to the computer, convert it to Rec. 709, and then you know you might not like what you got. And then you go do the process all over again. Hey, let me see if I can do this. What happens if I do this light modifier versus this? Let me add some diffusion here. Let me add some negative fill here. So you're just going to have to play around with it. And um, there's plenty of videos and tips and tutorials online on YouTube that you can find that will help you to dial in general light placement and different techniques that you can use to light your shots. Last is LED flicker. I've got this little LED globe that's the uh, moon, and it, I had that in the background of my shots initially, but it's a cheap LED, so it ends up kind of pulsing in the background. And off to my left, I have a Philips Hue light bulb. Those also, if you dim them down, uh, they're not running at a constant pulling rate or pulse rate of the LED. So shooting at 24 frames per second, uh, that also has some banding as an LED light as well. So choose your background lights appropriately, I guess is the moral of this story. But again, it's kind of a um, something you might not see when you first set up the shot and you may not notice it until the, you're done shooting and you're looking at the video in post. All this to say, don't let lighting conditions stop you from making videos. You will figure it out as you go. You'll tweak different settings on each video until you have something that you can replicate or that you like. And you'll change it up eventually anyways. Different angles in the room to shoot at require you to put lights in different spots. So just keep making progress. Don't worry about it too much. Your first videos are gonna be your worst videos and you'll keep improving every single time you turn on the camera. That brings us to audio last, which is interesting because it's one of the first things that I'll want to do in post-processing. At least in Final Cut Pro, it's a little bit challenging to mess with audio settings at a clip-by-clip -clip level. So if I have a long A-roll clip like this and I am recording mainly on a lav mic, that I know picks up different frequencies throughout this room, not so much a dynamic microphone, but if I have some EQ settings that I wanna go tweak, I'll wanna do that first while I have a big long A-roll clip. Um, syncing audio and video in post, I typically have a multicam clip, so before I start cutting that up, I wanna go through and listen and make any of those EQ adjustments. So I'm really doing it at the A-roll clip level first. That way it also makes the editing experience a little more pleasant for me. So some of those harsh frequencies can get tuned out as I'm cutting and chopping footage. Second tip for audio is listen in multiple locations. 
So grab yourself a pair of headphones, toss in your AirPods, maybe send a clip to your smartphone, or go listen to it on your living room TV. And you do that process to start to tune your ears to how your different recording equipment sounds to know are there frequencies in this room that I need to tune out no matter what microphone I'm using or is the EQ fine? Are my levels okay? Because you can't replicate every scenario of everybody that will be listening to your audio. But if you can get it to sound good on headphones, an iPhone, and a TV screen for equipment that you have, then chances are it'll sound good for everybody else too. Final tip for audio is don't rush. I've made mistakes of plugging the cable into the wrong port on the microphone. I've made the mistake of plugging the cable into the wrong port on the camera. I get so jazzed up sometimes to start filming that I'm like, oh man, I gotta get this idea out. I gotta plug everything in, turn it on, get started, let's go. And then I'll sit and record for 20, 25, 30 minutes, get to the end and realize I had no audio the entire time, which is kind of a heart sink moment. You know, oh, how could I be so dumb? So just take your time, right? And this comes as one of the benefits of taking test shots. So slow down, take your test shot, make sure your audio is good, do some video checks. I'm not sure, <laughs> I've gotten better at doing test shots. There are still times where I get excited and I um, sit down and turn on and start recording. But as I've gotten more familiar with the features of the camera and the equipment I'm using, uh, those mistakes have happened less often. <laughs> They're not, not foolproof though yet, that's for sure. All right, and lastly, I'll say have a structure, but don't make it too rigid. So you want to be able to have a template that you can structure your videos off of. In my Apple Notes, I have a video template. Apple Note has questions like, you know, what video are you, are you making? Why are you making it? How are you going to make it? What equipment are you going to use? So on and so forth. I have a spot to drop in title and thumbnail ideas, and I have a spot to sort of, you know, script in rough terms, the video. What are the main talking points that I'm going to talk about? What different shots do I need to go along with those? And corresponding in my to-do app, I have templates for, you know, coming up with title, thumbnail, hook. I have a template for shooting the video, editing the video, and posting the video to make sure that I'm not wasting time, either duplicating efforts, doing things more than I need to be doing, but I've created the process of how I, I would like to work through it to help me save time while creating videos. Next is take notes as you go on things that you want to improve. So this video is basically my lessons learned note. As I've screwed up lighting and audio and video, I've jotted these things down. Yeah, okay, next time I've got to set the white balance to 5,600 Kelvin instead of 5,400 Kelvin. Okay, in this video, I did 40% brightness on the key light. I really probably should have done 60% brightness on the key light. Remember that no video is going to be perfect. Even the best photographers and filmmakers and YouTubers haven't made a perfect video. If they did, they would have made it and then they wouldn't be doing YouTube or photography or filmography anymore. Along with that is a lot of the people that you're watching on YouTube have been doing this for years, maybe even decades in some instances. If you're just starting out, you don't need to compare yourself to somebody with millions of followers and thousands of videos on YouTube. Compare yourself to you. Was your second video better than your first video? Was your 10th video better than your second video? As long as you're improving and working to improve yourself and your videos over time, that's all that matters. So I've given you a bunch of mistakes that I've made in these videos and I've worked over time to make each one a little bit better in my opinion than the last. So don't be embarrassed when you make mistakes. It's okay, we all do it. You may not see it because they don't get posted, but here you go, here's mine. And lastly, ties in with all of this, don't be too hard on yourself. You're learning a new skill that actually requires a multitude of skills, right? Creating videos on YouTube is kind of as simple as turning the camera on and talking to it. But at the same time, you have to learn filmography, you've got to learn audio, you have to learn editing, you have to learn packaging, you have to learn thumbnails, you have to learn titles, you have to learn descriptions, right? You're doing 
at a minimum like 10 different jobs when you're creating a YouTube video. And each one of those different disciplines could be a full-time career on its own, and they are. So there will be times that you're down on yourself and, oh man, I could have done that differently or that video didn't get nearly as many views as I hoped it did. And some days this will even be dressed in overalls and look like work because it absolutely is work. You are working extremely hard when you make these videos. So be realistic about your goals. You don't control the subscriber count. You don't control the thumbs up button. And you barely even control how many people your video will get shown to. So make what you want to make. Use each video as a learning opportunity and enjoy the ride. Until next time, see ya.